Nearly 40 years into the war on cancer. Have we been fighting the wrong battles? Deborah Davis thinks so. She's a scientist and public health expert. In a provocative new book, she argues we have been too focused on treating cancer while ignoring its environmental causes. The book is called The Secret History of the War on Cancer. You've written an absolutely scathing critique of the so-called uh, war on cancer, and that basically your thesis is is that we've, we've aimed our weapons at the wrong target. Make, make that case. Expand on that for me. Well, think of this. It's 1971, and the United States officially launches a war on cancer. Richard Nixon, that's right. Richard Nixon, our president, decides he, he's losing the war in Southeast Asia, so he starts two wars in 1971, one against cancer, the other against drugs. Now, he wants a war that you can win, and some people have come in and told him, in 10 years you're going to be able to cure cancer, which, of course, most scientists at the time thought was ridiculous. He starts a war on the disease, and completely ignores the things that they were then known to cause cancer. 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General declares that smoking causes cancer. Seven years before the war on cancer is launched, smoking causes cancer. What is not in the war on cancer? Smoking. What is not on the war on cancer? Asbestos. What is not on the war on cancer? Benzene or synthetic hormones. And all of those were known to cause cancer in 1971. So the war starts focusing on the wrong enemies, with the wrong weapons. So right by focusing exclusively on the, the quest for a cure, Correct. they ignore the causes. Basically. Now, there were people who said they wanted to pay attention to the causes, but they got swept off. Now, the book is, uh, is called The Secret War. Why secret? Well, it, because most people are not aware that when the war on cancer gets started, there was basically a backroom deal is made. Let's forget about really attacking tobacco. Even in the 1980s in Canada, when the government was doing studies showing that there was an increase in uh, lung cancer and other diseases associated with t smoking, researchers were hired by the tobacco industry in Canada to discount the work of the Canadian government on the dangers of tobacco. I want to talk about the re research uh, in, in a second, because that's an interesting story all by itself. But, but even on that, I mean, the Surgeon General says in 1964, you know, he said right out there, and it goes gets right on the package, just smoking causes cancer. Yet you're saying at this time, the, of all, forget about the tobacco industry and the advertising industry, is that the American Medical Association and the American Cancer Society are also working with the tobacco industry. How so? Absolutely. Morris Fishbein, who was the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association, was in close collaboration with the tobacco industry. The AMA held stock in the tobacco industry and did research for the tobacco industry well into the 1970s and early 1980s. Yet the Surgeon General's telling them this is, this is their enemy. Oh, that's right. And there were these ridiculous advertisements about doctors recommend smoking camels and doctors recommend smoking for your T-zone. Uh, there's a, a, amazing evidence of the uh, inappropriately close collaboration between the medical professions and uh, tobacco for many, many years. Much more generally that we have known uh, for, for some time that there are environmental causes, not simply genetic causes uh, of cancer that have been linked uh, to, to the disease. Tell me first about what that knowledge has been historically, what we know today. All right. Well, one of the first observations that was made in the 1930s was that identical twins, which are as close to a clone as we have in human nature, coming from one egg that splits into two embryos, do not get the same cancer all the time. We know that genes give us the gun and the environment fires the trigger. Mm. The evidence on that is clear from studies of twins, studies from what happens to people who come from Asian countries and move to the United States or Canada, how they acquire the risk of cancer in the United States or Canada once they've been here uh, two generations. So we know that it's the genes interacting with the environment that determines whether or not um, we, we get cancer. I want to just take a little sidebar right right there because I mean I think central to the, the thesis that you're putting forward is that there probably isn't a cure for cancer. Well, I would know a I, cure, a big oh. silver <laughs> bullet that's just going to eradicate all forms of cancer forever. <clears throat> yes, you're right. There, cancer, first of all, is more than 200 different types of disease, all of which involve malignant cell growth that stays out of control, and the idea that there would be a silver bullet one single cure for cancer 
I think at this point, scientists understand because there are many different types of cancer. They occur in many different types of cells and organs. With probably myriad compound causes right. from the research that, that, that you've been doing. Exactly. And always, the, it's the interaction. It's the sum total of all of the things that happen to you in the course of your lifetime. Or in the case of children, it's the things that happen to your parents prior to your conception and early in your embryonic right. life. And, and that knowledge in many ways just buttresses the case that we really have to focus on causes rather than exclusively on cures. And we have to pay, look, we need attention to both things. I am a cancer orphan. I lost both my parents to the disease. I was very fortunate that they got the best care that they possibly could. In my father's case, he lived for almost seven years with a disease he was, I was told he was going to die within three to six months. So we know that we've made tremendous progress in treating some forms of cancer. Right. That's why in the United States today, we have 10 million cancer survivors. That's the good news. The bad news, unfortunately, is that one out of 10 of them is under the age of 40. And unfortunately, teenagers and young adults with cancer don't do as well as children with the disease. We're not quite sure why, but we do know that there are growing environmental causes uh, that we haven't fully understood. One example, testicular cancer, it's increased 50% in every industrial country where we've looked. Now, we hear about Lance Armstrong as this great success story, which he is. Yeah, it's an seemingly unlikely candidate. You can find him more fit, more healthy. Amazing story of someone who had cancer throughout his body and then goes on to win the Tour de France several times. Yet, he's also a very important symbol of what's wrong with cancer because he's not alone. There are growing numbers of young men like well, him. Well, you make that point, 50% increase across the world. You know, why should we be concerned about that, other than from the obvious reasons that, that it, it's growing? Do we have any understanding of the linkage there? Well, in that case, we do know that some things that affect males early in their growth as embryos and fetuses appear to have an increased risk on whether or not they're going to get testicular cancer as, as young adults. Because as the testis matures, the probability that cancer will develop grows, and so testicular cancer tends to rise in young men in their 20s when their testes have finally matured, but may be a consequence of things that happened to them when they were embryos or very early in life. Well, the early in life part of, of cancer uh, data is also very, very alarming. I mean, you, you make the point that child, childhood cancers are on uh, the increase. I think 10% of those 10 million cancer survivors are under the age of uh, 40. Why is this happening? I don't really know, uh, but I do know that while childhood cancer is rare, it's less rare than it used to be. And the same, of course, is true for testicular cancer. Mm. But what we do know from research done at Health Canada and well, also in the United States is that children of parents who work as farmers have an increased risk of childhood cancer. And there are studies done in Minnesota showing that when children are born nine months after the peak of spraying by their fathers, there's an increased risk of childhood cancer and an increased risk of birth defects, more so, by the way, in boy babies than girl babies. We also have evidence from work at Sarnia that there is a reduction in the birth of baby boys in areas with high rates of pollution. Now, we don't know all the different factors that are contributing to this, but from studies that have been done in Italy and elsewhere, we find that in areas with unusual pollution patterns, there's been a reduction in the proportion of baby boys born relative to baby girls. And this actually could be related to the same things that cause testicular cancer. Because we know that the things that affect whether or not a boy is going to be conceived or born are, are driven by what's on the father's side of the equation. The Y chromosome really determines whether or not you're going to have a boy baby or a girl baby. And something could be affecting the Y chromosome and its ability to make healthy baby boys. And the same things could be affecting the chance that boys that are conceived can develop testicular cancer. Let's go back to this secret history of uh, the, the, the war on cancer. I mean, we have these notional uh, linkages between the environment and, uh, and cancer. Uh, lots of involvement of people who are in the, in, in the cancer business, basically, manufacturing uh, cancer-related uh, products involved in uh, the agencies purported to be looking to stop uh, the growth uh, of the disease. But also, you've documented and found that it was research being suppressed and research being monkeyed with. Talk to me about that. 
Well, there was a period of time in the uh, late 1950s and 60s when the National Cancer Institute started its environmental carcinogenesis program. And this was directed by a very interesting guy, originally from Germany, named Wilhelm Hooper. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hooper did a worldwide survey and was convinced that there were many environmental causes of cancer. And in the 1950s and 60s, campaigned to inform physicians about workplace and environmental causes of cancer. But among the things that happened was this extremely close collaboration in the 1950s between industry and the government, so that this fellow Hooper, who was doing research on the environmental and occupational hazards for workers from uranium mining, from cobalt mining, from asbestos, uh, from coal tars, all of a sudden he was getting messages to pull back. His research was being reviewed and reviewed and not released. And in his very bitter memoirs that I found not published, um, he disclosed that he finally realized what was going on there. The government was sending his papers out to the industry for review, and, and the industry was saying, you can't let this guy publish this stuff. And he only found out about this toward the end of his life when he was subpoenaed to testify in a workers' compensation case. In addition to the suppression, I mean, there's also evidence that there were cancer researchers who were put on the payroll of corporations and organizations that, again, are subject to uh, the allegations of, of, of the linkage. Again, yeah. describe that, that situation. One of the most disappointing things that I learned, and I was researching this book, was that one of my personal heroes, Sir Richard Dahl, had himself been working directly for the asbestos industry uh, for many, many years and working for the chemical industry for many, many years. Now, Richard Dahl uh, deserves credit for being one of the first Western researchers to publish the findings showing that tobacco increased the risk of cancer. Ironically, he also published some of the first studies on asbestos and cancer. What I did not know is that he went to work for the asbestos industry and for years afterwards would come in and testify against workers who were seeking compensation for their illness. He, he worked also for Monsanto in the case of dioxin. And he worked uh, for Monsanto with respect to vinyl chloride. And in those circumstances, when someone of his standing published findings saying, in my opinion, there is no association between vinyl chloride and brain cancer and liver cancer, um, it was accorded a great standing. Only after he died and left voluminous files did some researchers find in his own files at Oxford University that he had received $1,500 a day starting in 1979 as a consultant for the chemical industry. Now, you talk about the suppression of research and the, and the putting on the payroll of, of so-called scientific, objective scientific uh, experts as you know, part of the, the cocktail of creating a, a culture of doubt. This is right. a big part of the strategy, right. as long as you can say everything's inconclusive. Is this still going on today? Absolutely. There are some you know, public relations geniuses who have figured out that you can take doubt and hold it up like a cross to the vampire. We have doubt, and therefore, because we can create doubt, we should do nothing, we should say nothing. And give, me what, a, give me an example of where that's happening right now. Well, see. where it's happening right now is on aspartame. Mm. Aspartame is one of the most widely used artificial sweeteners in the world, although they're shifting because of evidence that I'm about to tell you about. And we don't have definitive proof of human harm from aspartame. Yet the allegations are old. I remember as a kid people telling me, don't drink all of that, you know what. Yeah, well, I hope that uh, you listened. But the reality is 200 million people in the United States and probably about 12 million in Canada are regularly using aspartame every day. And new studies that I refer to in my book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, show that if you start giving animals aspartame prior to birth, that is when their mothers are pregnant with them, or start when they are very young, by the time they reach their 60s, that is to say the third deck year of an animal's life, many of them will have tumors. Now the question for us is, we don't have the time to wait to see whether children today, when they reach their 60s, are going to have an increased risk of cancer. And at this point, I, I think it's a risk not worth taking. Let me give you an example. I can't prove to you that aspartame is harmful for humans today based on human evidence. 
but I can sure tell you that some of the evidence that's been submitted is really bogus and is nothing other than trying to raise that doubt and put that cross up to the vampire. Let me give you an example. They did a study where they took people who were 55 years of age and asked them, did you drink a diet soda? And then five years later, they asked them, do you have brain cancer? And guess what? They, say, they said yes and no? Yes. And the answer was, well, there was no increase in brain cancer risk. And that study got published as though it was exonerating now, aspartame. The part uh, the, in the book, you write extensively about the burden of proof, both the burden of proof by legal definition and scientific uh, definition. It's very controversial. I mean, what would you do in these kind of instances where there is, you know, bad research, good research, but doubt? You know, you'd, you'd be pretty tough. Yeah, we have to err on the side of caution, it seems to me. I mean, if there's a matter of national security, then I think one wants to give wide berth. But if we're dealing with issues like artificial sweeteners, uh, then I think we have to take a very hard You'd say it, it's look. not 100%, but there's enough there. Just shut her down. I, I think that it, it's really not worth the risk. I mean, what is the benefit of, of using aspartame? Ironically, the team of researchers in Italy that did this new studies that I'm talking about now, as the young women working in the lab started to see these results, they stopped using aspartame. And as a group, they learned that within two months of stopping to use aspartame, they'd lost 10 pounds each. It turns out aspartame is an appetite stimulant because mm. it makes the brain think yeah. it doesn't have enough sugar, so people seek sugar and calories from other sources. So a lot of the so-called light and, uh, and, and low-fat right. stuff does. Yeah, I actually think sugar and honey is okay for you, and there's agave, and there's stevia, and there's other things that are probably fine if you need to use that sort of material. Breast cancer. What is the evidence there in terms of environmental linkages? Well, a recent review article, which is in my book as well, identifies more than 200 different widely used materials in the United States and Canada today that have been shown to cause an increase in mammary tumors in rodents. And so the issue is, if it causes rodents to get mammary tumors, and sometimes, by the way, it can cause a male rat to get breast cancer, and they're not even supposed to have breasts, then what does it mean for us? And what we've done progressively is we've moved away from using animal evidence to saying, wait, the only proof we can t accept that something causes breast cancer in humans is sufficient numbers of people who all die of breast cancer for whom we can say that that gun oh, fired that bullet Over into a 20-year period. Absolutely. Th these products include, by the way, uh, beauty products and household products. Unfortunately so. We don't realize that in the United States and Canada, the government today does not require safety evaluations of things that we put in our cleaning products or in our beauty products. And that's clearly got to change. You, it's perfectly legal now in terms of nail polish and shampoos and cleaning compounds for them to contain things that can form benzene or form formaldehyde, which are two known carcinogens. And really, I think that it's time to rethink those policies. Cell phones. Uh, I mean, they're ubiquitous. Uh, they we, are. We, we need them. We seem they to say really, lies. really need them. Yes. But you again, you say that there's there's evidence over a ten year period, which is really all that we've been using them with any kind of frequency among heavy u users, that there's some real dangers there. Studies in Sweden, where they've used cell phones longer than we, have found that people who use cell phones for ten years or more have double the risk of acoustic neuroma or certain types of brain cancer. Now, I'm counting on the electrical engineers to fix this problem. I believe that current generations of cell phones are probably a lot safer than the older ones. Mm. I recommend two things. Children should not use cell phones except for emergencies. In Bangalore, India, it's illegal to sell a cell phone to someone under the age of 16. And if you have a cell phone, which most of us do, and I do, use it with an, a speaker phone so that you don't have it close to your body. Don't keep it on your body all, at all times, or use it with a headset that has a hollow tube at the end, hmm. a blue tooth or a blue tube, which will give you less direct microwave radiation to the brain. You know how your head gets warm, your ear gets yeah, warm? Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, that's not a good thing, especially for teenagers. Their heads are hot enough. Well, in fact, you're showing that this research, that the, the tumors tend to exist disproportionately on the very side of that brain that the person is used to use putting the, the telephone against their head. And at Pittsburgh, we're working with Dr. Dade Lunsford in neurosurgery to evaluate the cases of acoustic neuroma that they've accumulated there uh, to see whether or not there, there is that clear association 
with acoustic neuroma in cell phone that the Swedes have suggested. Now, let me be clear, we are hoping and seeing improvements in cell phone technology, but we need to ensure that they take place. The formal requirements in China for a cell phone have their emissions of microwaves that are 500 times less than those allowed in the United States today. PET scans, uh, MRIs, uh, CT scans, we see these as you know, part of modern uh, scientific imaging, a salvation for the, uh, the disease concerns. You're again saying these things are wildly overprescribed. Well, now they're not all a problem. Let me be clear about something. CT scans, a computerized tomographic scan of a child, of a baby, mm -hmm. for the head or abdomen, can give them the equivalent of between 200 to 6,000 chest x-rays from a single scan. In an emergency, you need a CT scan. We are seeing growing rates of use of computerized tomographic scans in children when it's not an emergency. And that is a problem because we know that radiation risks accumulate over a lifetime. And if we start radiating children when they're very young, they're going to be at an increased risk of developing cancer. And a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine confirmed this and estimates that current patterns of cancer, between 1 and 2 percent of all cancer, could be associated with past use of inappropriate diagnostic radiation. Now, an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, or an ultrasound, does not involve radiation exposure and can often give you information where you do not need to do a CT scan. Now, you, you head up, we should make this clear right now, though, the world's only on, uh, environmental oncology center uh, at, the, at the University of, uh, of Pittsburgh. Tell me about the basic work that you're doing there. Well, our center at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute has four components. We have basic researchers who are studying the ways that cancer gets turned on and off using things like br certain extracts from broccoli to kill cancer cells. We're doing research in people including studying the way these things might affect people to prevent or reverse cancer and looking at large-scale patterns in cancer in farmers and others in order to get clues about avoidable causes. A fourth part of our program is in fact to educate doctors themselves and nurses about things that they can do, how to take better histories, how to get information on the environmental causes for their patients and how to advise cancer patients and their families so that they reduce the chance that cancer will recur. Now, looking at what you're, what you're doing there at the Environmental Oncology Center, I actually wondered if, in, in a perverse way, if your research might harm action. Because as you find all of these multiple sources mm -hmm. uh, of linkages to cancer and, and, and come to realize that many of them have a compounding effect, the notion of a cause, you know, is blown out of the water. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple cause. So, what, if there's no single cause, what is the call for action? Right. Well, you know, that, that's a, ve a very good question. I think you have to start with what anyone can control in their lives. The obvious thing that we all know is that what you eat affects your health. Hippocrates, 2,000 years ago, said food is medicine. So we have to be smarter about the things we take into our bodies. We have to understand you don't have to eat everything organic, but when it comes to fruits and vegetables, the things that you cannot eat the peel of probably don't need to be organic. Pineapples, bananas, mangoes, mm. all right? So we know about nutrition. We also need to think about the skin as being the body's largest organ. And therefore, things you put onto your body, whether it's shampoo or makeup or cleaning compounds that you come in contact with, we need to do a better job of getting rid of the things in them that may increase our risk of cancer. And I think we have to be sensible about this. None of us wants to go back to be a Luddite and put our heads in the sand and go back to a total independent survivalist way of living. Modern society brings with us many benefits, but we have to be smarter about what things we accept, what risks we accept, and what risks we say are unacceptable. And the Canada at this point and the United States have got to join the rest of the civilized world. It is appalling that at this time in our nation's histories that we still export and import asbestos-related products. Canada's a big exporter. Absolutely. The problems of asbestos, like the problems of tobacco, require a government solution along with the private sector. Just as the government is going to have to bail out the tobacco farmers as that industry is dying, they're going to have to come up with a plan for transition for the asbestos mines as, as well. 
Now, what other things? Uh, I mean, you talk about almost a, a truth and reconciliation uh, process, much like they did in South Africa after apartheid, has to be applied right. in this area before we're going to get some real public policy initiatives right. that are going to work at the source cause of this disease. Now, let's talk about what has not worked. It has not worked to have an adversarial system where you sue people to get information about hazards that they knew about. And if you're really lucky and you have a smart lawyer and somebody who is not dead yet that can make a compelling case, sometimes you get compensation. But more often than not, particularly with the reforms that have taken place in the United States, it becomes harder and harder for people who allege that they've been harmed by pollution to recover any damages. And there's no incentive right now for the companies to come forward with information. Now, I have friends in high places in multinational corporations that tell me, look, we know, we have the information, and I'd, we'd like to be able to give it to you, but our lawyers won't let us. They say patent protection is uh, part of the thing, trade secrets. Right, and they know that if they spend enough money and enough time saying no, people will basically go away, and sometimes they'll be dead before they can get any, any compensation. So I, I've been following with some interest the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, and in Argentina and other areas. Because you think you have to almost offer a period of amnesty before these people will come forward. That's... I think amnesty in the sense of immunizing them from punitive damages. In the United States, punitive damages, which are in excess of damages that for what you've softened as direct harm, can be hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. If we say to companies, we won't charge you with punitive damages if you will agree to come forward with what you know now, about brain cancer in the aircraft industry or associations of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the semiconductor industry or increases of breast cancer associated with, with semiconductors as theoretical examples. If you come forward with that information now, give it to us in a neutral fashion and agree to pay anybody harmed who did work for you, then we can create an information source that we can do something with. And right now, there's no incentive for companies to come forward with information, and there's every incentive for them to just keep stonewalling. Deborah Davis, I want to thank you very, very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Likewise. Thank you so much.